Well, if you are new to Northview, uh, welcome to the party. We're so thrilled that you are here. Welcome to all of our campuses, those watching online. Everyone in the room, can you join me in welcoming everybody? We're so thrilled that you are with us. We are in uh, week three of a series called Killing Hostility. Maybe this is week four. And in it, we are studying the book of Ephesians. And I, I hope that you are enjoying just reading through scripture and doing a deeper dive into this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to this church in Ephesus that had some similar dynamics as to what we are facing in our world today and things that we are also trying to navigate. And we are gonna continue leaning into that uh, today. Now, I gotta tell you, and if you've been around Northview, you've already picked up on this. I have a, a bit of ADD when it comes to uh, communicating and getting to teach. Sometimes I'll do it from behind a pulpit. Sometimes I'll do it with the TV. Sometimes I'll do it with the whiteboard. Uh, sometimes I'll do it up there. Now I'm doing it down here. Uh, sometimes I like to just teach theology. Other times I like to preach with enthusiasm. And then there are times I just like to geek out over the backstory and to give the history uh, behind our heritage uh, of the faith. And that is going to really be where today's message is at. Now, I think there is a backstory that I think is uh, amazing. In fact, I think it's at some points comical, other points inspiring. There are points about it that are irritating to see the role that the religious folks played in it. Uh, but when you understand the backstory, it does open our hearts and minds to wait a second. If God can do that in a situation like that, maybe he can do the same in my situation. And know this um, about the book of Ephesians. Uh, Paul has a very similar way of addressing matters and writing. And Paul's writings almost always start out in the same way. He starts out high on theology and then he transitions into a practical application. So it's, it's very theological, and then it becomes very practical. And we are right at the point, chapter three in the book of Ephesians, where Paul's about to begin making that shift. Now, if you're in a life group and you wanna have some deeper conversations, I would say the book of Ephesians, in many ways, breaks down into three categories. And it would be wealth, walk, and warfare. Now, when I say wealth, it's not how you and I understand wealth in our American society. It's not how we understand wealth in terms of earning our salary or paycheck. That's not what it means. But Paul begins chapter one, as we already addressed, and he says, you and I who are in Christ have been blessed in every spiritual measure, that you and I are rich in Christ that there is a spiritual wealth that has been deposited into our life. And so he wants us to understand right out the gate, God has been good to you and God is for you and God seeks to do remarkable things in and through your life. And I get the feeling every time we gather and every time I get the opportunity to teach or have conversations that so many people are completely unaware of how good God has been to them or how good God desires to be to them moving forward. And I just gotta tell you, if you're not a Christian or maybe you're new and you're, you're just leaning into this process, this God that we serve is unparalleled. There's no one like him and what he came offering and what he has established on your behalf and on my behalf is astonishing, it is remarkable, it is breathtaking and it is life altering. And we gather every single week to celebrate this. Our God is good, can I get an amen? He's good that we are blessed beyond measure in Christ. And, and he goes from this idea of wealth and he transitions into this idea of your walk. How do we walk this out? What does it look like practically as we live a life in light of what Christ has done for us? You know, a couple years ago, this movie was released and it was telling the backstory of Michael Jordan's shoe contract with Nike. It's a fascinating story. And there's this scene in the previews where Michael Jordan's mom, who did most of the negotiating for him, is talking to these Nike representatives. And she makes a pretty bold demand about the contract. And at the time, no one really had a signature shoe deal the way Michael Jordan does and now how we would understand uh, signature shoes for these athletes. Michael Jordan, in many ways, was a first of his kind. And she makes this demand, and the Nike rep uh, says to her, uh, it's just a shoe. To which she responds, it's just a shoe until my son steps into it. 
And history proved to be the case that the moment Michael Jordan stepped into the shoe, uh, this now becomes the number one signature shoe in the history of athletics. And I say that because to an even greater degree, uh, the son of God stepped into our shoes and he ultimately changed the game forever. And in some way, he established a new reality and a new standard. Jesus completely redefined what it means to be human. And in stepping into our shoes, he extends the invitation for you and I to do what? To step into his shoes. And he establishes this reality that because of his triumphant work of the cross, there's now life beyond the grave. Death has lost its sting. We don't have to fear the grave, that we can live with an anticipation and a hope and a confidence for eternity with our heavenly father. He, he stepped into our shoes, and so now we, we walk according uh, to his standards. We walk according to his values. But the end of the book, and where we're eventually gonna land, is this idea of warfare. Folks, the birthmark of a Christian, what do we say? Is a target. That where the Lord leads you, the enemy will often meet you. There is a predictable resistance, and po folks will often say, man, Life is more challenging now that I'm a Christian, which I always think to myself, well, of course. Satan didn't have to attack you when you were self-sabotaging on your own, but now that you are running against the grain of his agenda in the world, you pose as a threat to the evil and the wickedness that is now trying to pervert and overcome our, our society and our communities. And, and so every morning when you wake up and your feet hit the ground because you're a child of God, all of hell you know, and just trembles. And so there's a warfare to this thing. And I would be irresponsible as a pastor to inspire you to place your faith in Jesus Christ and to talk about the goodness of God, but not also say, hey, heads up, Satan's gonna throw a punch at you. But greater is he, come on, that is within you than he that's within the world. And so we rise up in faith and we follow Christ uh, with a long obedience in the same direction. That is faith, amen. And this is where, where Paul is leading us. Now, I gotta tell you, last night I asked Kristen, I said, what'd you think of the message? And she said, you know, the, the first half was rough, uh, but you ended well. <laughs> and uh, so if you can just bear with me, I, I think there's some bumps in this next part, but we're gonna get to a place uh, where you're really gonna like it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna read one verse and, and then we're gonna stop and we're gonna give a ton of background information and I'm gonna talk really fast to get it all in at the, uh, with the time that we have today. And then we're gonna go back to the passage. And the reason why we're gonna do it that way is because of how Paul writes chapter three. I also do gotta say, before we begin reading this, uh, what I'm reading from my Bible and what you will read on the screen isn't going to fully match up. And the reason for that is uh, this is my go-to Bible. This one goes with me everywhere. It sits in my car, it fits in my backpack, it goes with me when I travel. And this is a 1984 NIV edition of the Bible. And if you know anything about the 1984 edition, they eventually began to look at it and say, hey, I think there's some opportunity for us to improve the translation of the NIV. And so they improved the translation, less than 5% of the NIV translation was updated and adjusted. And now the 1984 edition is out of print. You can't buy this at the store because the words are not just quite right. And uh, I love that because I was born in 1984 and I feel like my job is to teach on behalf of God and I never feel like my words are quite right. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm often frustrated. God, why can't I say it to them the way you said it to me? And uh, this one is falling apart and so don't judge me for all the duct tape that is on it. But I had a mentor who once told me, uh, you know, you show me a Bible that's falling apart and I'll show you a life that's not. And that's something that I'm hoping to be the case in my life. I don't know about you, but I'm just trying to hold it together and follow Christ to the best of my ability. And if you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter three. And here's the statement. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, if you notice and you look in your Bible, you maybe look at the, the translation on the screen, you will see a dash mark after the word Gentiles. Do you see that? And the reason for that is Paul begins to write this letter 
And he's not blessed to live in a time where he has a word processor to be like, no, I need to backspace. I need to say some things before I say this. So he just starts out with what is going to be a spiritual blessing in prayer. And he begins this statement and then he pauses. He's like, oh, wait a second. I, I need some, to say some other things. And for 12 verses, Paul just goes down a rabbit hole, giving some context and saying some things. And if you notice, verse uh, one, he says, for this reason. And then he comes back in verse 14, and he once again says, for this reason. So essentially, he starts out, and then he pauses, he digresses, and then he comes back to what he initially set out to do. And if you are new to the book of Ephesians, what we have been discussing is the whole overarching theme that Paul is addressing is the tension, the division, and the controversy between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? They are anyone who is of non-Jewish descent. So raise your hand at all of our campuses is if you are of non-Jewish descent. You don't have Jewish in your bloodline. Yeah, okay, so you're a Gentile. And Paul says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ for the sake of you, you Gentiles. And what Paul is writing and what Paul would give his entire life to establishing is God's desire to rescue and redeem all people. Anyone and everyone, despite your walk of life, despite what you've been through, despite the decisions that you've made and the upbringing that you had, if we entrust our life into the hands of this remarkable God, he can rescue, redeem, and leave us all forever changed, not just the Jewish people. That essentially after Christ, you know, pays ransom for humanity, the gospel jumps outside the Jewish community and is extended to the world. And as you would imagine, and what we find in scripture is this was highly controversial. This was a massive shift in the early church. In fact, you could argue that the book of Ephesians is Paul's most controversial letter because he is dialing into the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he starts out and he says, I, Paul, a, a prisoner. Now, as he digresses, there are a handful of things that Paul is gonna identify with. And again, if you're in a life group or maybe you're someone who wants to do a deeper dive, these are things that you might wanna look into. One, Paul identifies himself as a debtor. He identifies himself as someone who had a debt that he couldn't pay. And in not in some works-based ideology, but Paul just overwhelmed with gratitude, understands God has done so much on behalf of me. God has done remarkable things that I couldn't earn and things that I did not deserve, and now I wanna give the rest of my life in service to him. And I have almost a debt to pay that he's been so good to me, I just wanna give back in return to this Christ. I'm a debtor. I had a debt I couldn't pay, and now I just wanna repay him to the best of my ability, even though he doesn't require it. In addition to that, Paul views himself as a steward that God makes a deposit into every single one of our lives who open our hearts to Christ. And it is upon us to steward well that deposit. I, I tell my kids all the time, who you are is God's gift to you. Who you become is your gift to God. What do you do with what God has entrusted you with? What do you do with the theology that he's placed within your heart and the promises that he's fulfilled and the talent and the personality? How do you steward those things? And Paul's often talking about this idea of I've been entrusted and I have to make responsible, wise, and diligent decisions as a steward of this wonderful gift. And if you are a Christian, you have to see yourself as a steward. You have been entrusted with a remarkable gift and we get to steward it. Beyond that, Paul would identify himself as, uh, as a minister. That as a steward, my job is to, to minister to anyone and everyone I possibly can to apply the gospel to their situation. And here is a catastrophic miss in the westernized church. We think the only people who are ministers are those who work for the local church. 
it's a huge misunderstanding. If you are a follower of Christ, meaning you are now walking in step with him and participating in the cause of Christ, you are a minister. That you are entrusted with this incredible opportunity to share the good news, the gospel, with anyone and everyone that God entrusts you to have influence with. And as ministers of the gospel, our job is to add minister the gospel. Someone say, run it back. As ministers of the gospel, our job is to administer the gospel. You don't have to overthink this, but what I love about Christ is he didn't make his way throughout the region with a sermon in his back pocket. You don't see Jesus having a time of study and like writing some things down and then going out and be like, all right, I have something to say to you. No, Jesus didn't develop messages for people. Jesus derived messages from people. That he would go through life and he would bump into people and he'd be like, I can speak to that. I can speak to that. There's good news in that hopeful situation. There's good news for that brokenness. There's good news for that fear or for that despair. And as ministers of the gospel, that's how we ought to live. Hey, my God can work in that situation. That we approach everything, even the most you know, broken and just really discouraging situations, we lean in and hope in a confidence of knowing my God is able to work in that situation. So he views himself as a debtor, a steward, a minister. Maybe my favorite thing that he identifies with is he identifies himself as the least. Now, this is a progressing thought for Paul. You might wanna look into this. Around 55 AD, Paul writes the letter uh, to the Corinthians, and he says, I am the least among the apostles. Well, then he writes in 62 AD, this letter to the Ephesians, and he says, I'm the least among the saints. But around 65 AD, he writes a letter to Timothy and he says, among all the sinners, I am the worst. It's this progressing thought, least of the apostles, least of the saints, I'm the least of the sinners. That the more he followed Christ, the more humble he became. It's a beautiful thing that every single one of us, as we embark on this journey, God grafts within us a genuine, authentic, and sincere humility. And sometimes I think we need to be careful uh, for operating in an unwarranted and even unnecessary and at times even misleading arrogance within our faith. Paul, the more he followed Christ, he just recognized, I'm the least. I'm just one beggar telling other beggars where I found the crumbs. And Paul is building this idea, but the overarching idea that he anchors himself to is I, Paul, a prisoner. It's amazing. And I, I think to not know the backstory, to not know how Paul ended up in cuffs uh, would be to sell the story short. I, I mean, part of my job, in fact, my goal at least, every single week is two things. One, I wanna set apart Christ in the hearts and minds of everyone who's listening to me. I just want them to know there is no comparison. There is only one God. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the savior of the world, the light of the world, the true vine, the living water. He is our shield, our rock, our redeemer. He is our king. He's all the things. There's no one like Jesus. And then simultaneously, I just pray, Lord, help me say something that causes them to fall in love with your word. Help me say something that makes them go home and grab their own Bible and <laughs> open it up and start to read it for themselves. Because I'm telling you, God's word is so fascinating. And a great study for you this week would go to the book of Acts and start in Acts chapter 19 and just read it out for the rest of the book. Because what you find is the backstory to why Paul is a prisoner. In Acts chapter 19, here's a lot of information coming your way. Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus. Paul has arrived on the scene and now he is teaching the gospel in this, you know, really immoral and sideways culture and society. And what is interesting is Ephesus was known as the headquarters of the idol and false god Artemis. 
In fact, there was this massive temple in Ephesus that was to honor and to facilitate the worship of this God, Artemis. Well, Paul shows up and Paul starts to preach the gospel. And what happens? People start to give their life to Christ. People start to recognize, wait a second, he's God. And when you discover Christ is God, what happens to all the false gods in your life? They lose their appeal. You turn your back on them. You stop living for lesser things and you anchor your your life to the one sure thing, Christ and Christ alone. And so these individuals start to give their life to Christ and they start to turn from this faith and this religion in this idol Artemis. Well, this creates some tension and specifically with the silversmith in the community. So there were all these silversmiths and what would they do? They would make and form and craft all these little figurines of Artemis. You know, so people, what would they wanna decorate their homes with? A figurine of their God. Or when people would visit Ephesus, what would they wanna leave with? A souvenir. And so that one of the biggest businesses in Ephesus were these silversmiths building these little figurines that represented Artemis. Well, suddenly revival's breaking out in Ephesus. People are turning from this religion in this God, and now they're no longer wanting to buy these figurines. And so the silversmith come together and they're frustrated. Wait a second, this guy's killing our business. He's hurting our, our pocketbook. And so eventually they run Paul out of town. So Paul decides, okay, I'm going to head back to Jerusalem. You guys tracking with me? This is the part that my wife was like, babe, let him come up for air. (laughs) So he he decides, I'm gonna go back to Jerusalem. And everyone says, you can't. If you go back to Jerusalem, they're gonna kill you there because word has gotten out that you've been out here going throughout the region, extending the gospel to the Gentiles. You're gonna go back to the mother church in Jerusalem, which is all Jewish people who are offended and frustrated because you are extending the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul says, absolutely, I'm going back. So Paul goes back and they arrive and they immediately meet with James and some of the other elders. And James and the other elders tell him, guys, Paul, there are a lot of people who are frustrated with you right now. In fact, they're confused by what you're doing. So we have been discussing this and we think it would be a good sign if you were to show some alignment with the community. So right now there's a group of men down at the temple and they're making this vow, you should go down and show your support and align with them so the community will look at you and think, okay, Paul still uh, got both feet on the ground, he hasn't lost his way. So Paul shows up, he's like, I'll be a team player. I I can do some of this perception management. So he goes down there and as he arrives, there's an immediate disdain for his presence. And so a group of these Jewish religious leaders decide to make up a false narrative. And they start to tell people that Paul had allowed a Gentile into the holy place of the temple where only Jews were allowed. And so the rumor is Paul has completely defiled the temple. So they're frustrated and what happens is is this mob starts to just attack Paul. And this commanding soldier of the Roman Empire sees Paul being attacked and decides to jump in to save Paul. So he pulls Paul out of the mob and Paul was nuts. Maybe you have a friend like this. Paul just had his life saved. All these people were about to beat him to a pulp. And Paul's like, no, let me talk to him. So he gets up on this step and the commander's like, just make it quick. (laughs) And Paul turns around and he starts to tell his testimony. He's like, guys, there was a time where I hated Christianity. There was a time that I wanted to stomp this little community to the ground. In fact, I was a part of persecuting, in fact, giving the approval of murder of these Christians. And one day I was heading to Damascus. This is what you would read about in Acts chapter nine. And I was heading to Damascus and I was set on 
you know, destroying and persecuting the community of faith there within that city and heading in the wrong direction with the wrong people for the wrong reasons, God still gets it right. And Jesus shows up and met me on that path and radically changed my life. And the whole time he's sharing his testimony, people are leaning in and they seem to be open. Wait a second, God did do something amazing in this guy's life. But if you look at Acts chapter, I got it marked here, Acts chapter 22, and it won't be on the screen. Verse 21, Paul gets to the end of his testimony. And Paul says, then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. So they were, again, they were tracking with him. Okay, Christ saved your life. Christ did remarkable things. He met you on the broken road. That's amazing. Until he says, but then Christ told me, go and share the good news with the Gentiles. And these people lose their mind. If you read on in the passage, it says they start to throw dirt in the air and rip their hair and tear off their clothes. These people were nuts. Anyone seen a, a religious person have a temper tantrum? <laughs> Maybe on Facebook. And... Uh, they start to lose their minds to where the Roman soldiers are like, all right, this guy is not good for the community. So they bring him in and the commander decides to have Paul flogged. Well, Paul was brilliant and Paul knew his rights. And so Paul says, wait a second, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't punish me without a trial. To which these soldiers were like, we had no idea you were a Roman citizen. And here's what is comical. Paul then has to go through three trials. First, he has a trial with a guy by the name of Felix who's like, I can't find anything wrong with them, but if I let him go, they're gonna kill him. So then he has another trial with a guy by the name of Festus who's like, I can't find anything wrong with them, but if I let him go, they're gonna kill him. And then he has a trial with a guy by the name of King Agrippa who says the same thing. And they don't know what to do with Paul. And so Paul says, let me meet with Caesar. Let me meet with the emperor himself. And so they're like, all right, well, keep him in cuffs. He's still a prisoner until we figure out what to do with him. But we need to get him out of here because this group of people want him dead. And there's this amazing detail. Again, you, you gotta read it. It says, just to get Paul out of town, they got 200 soldiers, 300 horsemen, I'm sorry, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. 470 armed soldiers just to escort this one guy out of town. That's how big the threat was against him. Like, hey, they're gonna kill him. Everyone be on the lookout. Get everyone with the weapons. And so they get Paul out of town and Paul is placed on a ship heading to Rome to meet with Caesar. I mean, this is a pretty rough situation. If you're Paul, are you frustrated? Like you have been chased out of Ephesus. Now you're chased out of Jerusalem. You've been through three trials and now you're a prisoner on this boat. And then what happens? A storm comes and the storm completely rips apart the ship. And so Paul literally floats to land on a piece of ship, which is just fun to say. I think you could do an entire sermon with that as your title. So he floats the land on this island and the island is called Malta. Now get this, Paul has now gone through three trials. Paul has been ran out of every city that he's been in. Paul has now been shipwrecked. He then walks up on this island and there's a group of people gathered around a fire. And as he approaches, a snake jumps out of the fire and bites Paul. I mean, could it get any worse? Have you ever looked at your situation and thought, I thought I was at rock bottom, all to discover rock bottom had a basement, right? It just, it kept getting lower. So Paul gets bit by the snake and the whole community leans in. Like, wait a second, that's a lethal snake. Anyone who's ever been bit by that kind of snake dies immediately. So they all lean in to watch him die. You know how people do, they don't care if you're doing well, but they love to watch you when you struggle. And so everyone leans in which just take heart, sometimes that's how God's gonna give a platform to your influence in their life. People will pay attention to your pain, not your progress. 
You, you just stay faithful, amen? And Paul gets bit. They're all waiting for Paul to drop over dead, and Paul doesn't die. And they're amazed, and they start to ask questions. Wait a second. How did you not die? What saved you? Who saved you? Who protected you? And in that moment, what does Paul do? Paul does what Paul always does. He shares the gospel and the good news of Christ. And there's this detail that is amazing. It says, after doing so, the entire island gave their life to Christ. I think you could argue that Malta was Paul's most successful ministry assignment. And he didn't even know it was on the list. He just floated ashore and God was like, watch me work in this situation. The entire place is saved, but Paul is still a prisoner. And so Paul is then shipped back out to Rome where he arrives in Rome and is in, you know, being held captive as a prisoner. And it is there that Paul doubles down on this, this idea and this truth that the gospel is not just for the Jews, it is for the Gentiles. And after that entire journey, Paul then writes this letter to the church in Ephesus saying, hey, after everything I've been through, chased out of Ephesus, chased out of Jerusalem, three trials, shipwrecked on Malta, still a prisoner in Rome, I am unapologetic. This good news is for everyone. It's outstanding. One, I think we can take a lot of instruction from Paul. I think sometimes we tend to be overdramatic about our inconvenience. And Paul just had this resolve to continue marching forward, placing one foot in front of the other, despite what was coming his way. He understood that God is with me, God is for me, and somehow he's gonna use all of this. I'm not wavering. And I am willing to stand publicly and declare the goodness of God, even if it means inconvenience in my life. I believe we live in times where the world needs those type of people. Are you willing to stand publicly and declare the goodness of God unwavering with a righteous yet gentle resolve that tells the world around you, I don't care if you dislike it. It may not be popular, but this Jesus will forever be powerful. And he can change your life. And this is the backstory. It's fascinating. To which then Paul picks back up in verse 14 to where he was originally started. And he says again, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. This is something that you have to understand that God's work in your life, it will happen inside out. That God will begin a work in you that will eventually take place through you. Uh, but God cares deeply about the internal faculties of our life and fortifying our soul, our character, our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, and then eventually positioning us for effectiveness in the world. It begins internally. He says that you would be strengthened in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So if you've ever heard someone say, hey, ask Jesus into your heart, this is one of the first places that you get that type of language. He says, through your faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Think about that statement. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. Well, how do you know something that surpasses knowledge? And what Paul is saying is, I pray you are able to grasp how wide, how high, how deep, and how long the love of Christ is to know what surpasses knowledge. Essentially what he's saying is, if you live a little bit, and you open your life to Christ, what you will discover is there's no depth, no matter how low you find yourself in life, that God's grace and love does not scoop you up. There, there's no width, no matter how much you go sideways and deviate in your life, the hound of heaven still tracks you down. His grace and his love still encompasses the sideways maneuvers of your life. And in, no matter how high, 
no matter how successful you become, how great you accomplish things or achieve different things, even at your peak, you are still covered by the grace of God. What, what Paul is saying is over time you realize no matter what direction I go in, down, sideways, or up, I find that God's love still encompasses me, that God's love still surpasses me. I know that his love is great. I know that his love is real. Yet the thing I don't understand is how it continues to exceed everything I do in life. That's to know that which surpasses knowledge. Then he ends and he says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, here's the deal. I know many of you, you're, you're new. Some of you have not fully entrusted me to be your pastor, and, and I get how that works, uh, and I, I hope to earn that right at some point. But for five seconds, if I could just be your pastor, I would say that many people, and chances are several of you, are absolutely selling yourself short when it comes to your faith. Paul says, my prayer is that you would experience the full measure of God. And for a lot of Christians, their faith is simply an accessory. It's something they add to their life, not something that informs, shapes, and supports their life. And my prayer is that you would find the willingness, the courage, and the desire to go all in for the one who went all in for you. And would you just dive in without hesitation, without reserve, and give your life fully and truly and completely to Jesus Christ? Because I'm telling you, there's so much more to God than people are experiencing. And Paul's like, I want you to experience the full measure. Now watch how he ends. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. This is the preacher's passage. Like, if you can't preach this, you shouldn't preach. <laughs> now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Now watch this statement. To him be the glory in the church. It's a great statement. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen. Amen. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, immeasurably more than you could ask, think, or imagine. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that Paul has given us license to walk around as entitled children of God. That's not what it's doing. Paul is extending to us an invitation to stretch our faith. He's saying, go ahead, let your mind wander. Go ahead and just think for a second all of the possibilities and the, the wondrous things God could do in and through your life. And he says, no matter what you ask, think, or imagine, I believe that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever think or imagine. Well, Paul, how can you make such a statement? Well, there was a time that I was chased out of Ephesus. And, and I was ran out of towns and I went through multiple trials and I was shipwrecked and I landed here in Rome as a prisoner, but somehow God saved my life and somehow God used me to advance the kingdom of God. And somehow the letters that I wrote continue to be discussed and studied and have an impact all around the world for thousands of years later. What Paul would be saying is, guys, I didn't see any of that coming. I would have never imagined or thought, hey, would you put me on a cruise ship that stops at an island, also I can get those people saved and then land me in Rome. I didn't think about that, but God did more than I could think or imagine. And he says, to him be the glory in the church. So a wonderful idea that what you find in the book of Ephesians, what you discover with God's desire and plan for the world is God uh, is, uh, has been in the business of establishing a new society. And so what he does is he gives us a new life with new values that come with a new perspective and a new demeanor and new desires and a new devotion that comes with a new relationship. It changes our relationship with God and it changes our relationship with others. And what is that society and community called? The church that God's plan A was I'm going to build up a community of people who are marked by this grace, who just live in such a way that is different 
and appealing to the broken world around them. And the idea that God would show his glory within a community like this of broken people still following after Christ is outstanding. As believers, we should anticipate and eagerly await individuals to show up and experience church for the first time because in our mind, we should be thinking, oh, I can't wait for them to experience this community. I can't wait for them to get to know some of my church family. All of us are on a journey. All of us are trying to figure this out. All of us are enduring inconvenience. But the one thing that unites us is God is good, God is faithful, and God is at work among us, and his grace is sufficient for every single one of us, and we anchor ourselves to that. Now to him who is able. And that's what I love about this passage. And I love, again, where Paul starts. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. It's an interesting way of saying it. He doesn't say, I, Paul, a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't say, I, Paul, a prisoner of King Agrippa. He doesn't say, I, Paul, a prisoner of Caesar. He gets down the road and says, uh-uh. Nobody gets credit for this but Christ. I have been captivated by what Jesus has done in my life. And if I am being held captive by anyone, it is Jesus Christ and I am given the rest of my life to serve his will and to accomplish his purpose in the world. I am a prisoner of Christ. And I just wonder what would happen if we too embrace that mentality, if we too operated with that same type of willingness to say, I believe God desires to extend the good news to anyone and everyone. Paul says, therefore, be rooted in love and established in love. And I am with this, the, the two overarching illustrations in the Bible are agricultural and architectural. And essentially, the, the echo throughout scripture is God seeks to produce something in your life and God seeks to build something I just wonder what would happen if you opened yourself to the full measure of Christ, all to discover who God could build you into and what he could produce in you and through you as we as a community remain rooted and established in love, amen? At this moment, we're gonna pray and I have a song that I really want you to take in as we leave and Jay's gonna sing it, but let's pray at all of our campuses. God, we, we're so thankful for your goodness and we're thankful for your grace and God, would you help us as a community to be unwavering in our declaration of the gospel? Help us remain rooted and established in love and confident in your word that yes, there are things within our culture that concern us. There are things that uh, are perplexing, but they should not erode our confidence in your goodness. And despite what comes our way, God, we stand amazed by the way in which you uh, accomplish wonderful things in Paul's life. And we... We just know and we're full of hope, uh, believing that you will accomplish great things in our life despite whatever comes our way. We ask that you help us remain rooted and established in your love. In Jesus' name we pray.